Another important aspect of the Internet is social networking. You have things like Facebook, where anything you put about yourself stays forever. Um, you can't run away from your past anymore. <laughs> right. Maybe. The old relationships that you moved out of state to get away from, they can come chasing you again. All your old creditors, um, the law, who know? You know, I mean, it's like, um, like your life is, is now sort of an open book. You can't uh, get away. Sort of like the paparazzi can follow yeah. all of us, right? Yeah. So is that, is that a problem? I mean, do we have to learn to adapt to the Internet, or do we have to figure out how to make the Internet adapt to us? Do we have to change the Internet somehow? Well, I, I think it, it, by the time the Internet will have changed significantly, uh, the, uh, it, it will be sort of too late. And uh, that process is, is going to be uh, very, very slow. Uh, so I think the key thing for us is to learn how to, to use the Internet to uh, enhance our lives in physical space rather than moving into virtual space. And a number of years ago, a uh, Jesuit priest, uh, this was before smartphones and things like that, told me the quickest way to end a conversation was to do this. And I have never forgotten that. And I see people all over the place um, doing this and ending communication mm -hmm. with a person who's sitting right next to them. And I happen to believe that, that social interaction is very important. You can't be in two places at the same time. And, you know, basically, if every time the phone rings, you pick it up, you're sending the person who's across the table from you a very important message, right? So do we have to change our social skills? Is, is this something that will work itself out over time, or is this a fundamental problem? Well, I, if you talk to uh, Elias Abujad at Stanford, who's a psychiatrist who studied a lot of Internet compulsive behavior, uh, he will tell you that the typical Internet personality these days aggrandizes himself or herself, is more narcissistic, uh, is more aggressive on the internet and acts more immaturely and that those personality traits are now flowing over into our social interactions with people when we interact with them one on one. Is there any way to develop positive personality traits and propagate them through the internet because the internet could be a terrific educational tool if we're talking about thought contagions why not create positive thought contagions? You can absolutely have you know lots of positive effects I, I think it's a matter of you know learning how to use these things I mean it, it, all these things are around us and there probably hasn't been a technological tool that has been invented of any significance that uh, you can't use irresponsibly I mean I get in my car and uh, wind it up and drive 150 miles an hour down the bay shore and uh, there, uh, and I can use it irresponsibly, or I can get in, and I can be a pretty conscious driver. And so these things are with us, and the, the a lot of this just has to do with personal discipline. Now, unlike road traffic, there isn't much regulation of the internet. Do you think there should be some kind of regulation, like certain financial transactions? There's sort of a flow restrictor that enables just so much information to pass so you slow it down and force people to think more about what they're doing. Well, among the things that I think we have to do in, for example, in the case of the financial system, uh, there was James Tobin, I think it was in 1958, proposed something called a Tobin tax that would take place on all financial transactions. And uh, for an example, I think high frequency trading has some benefit. And if 10% of the stocks traded on the exchange were being high-frequency traded, um, that would be great. At 60%, uh, it, it basically, we could get into a long, involved discussion, but I could explain to you why I feel it's very, very destructive. So in that case, uh, a tax of probably on the order of a hundredth of a percent, because the trading margins are so small, would dramatically reduce the 
amount of high frequency trading and it would reduce the amount of positive feedback in the trading system. So I think there are things like that that you can do with regulation that would probably make sense. And then who would do the regulating because the internet is a global phenomenon so wouldn't regulations also have to be international to work? Well, you're getting into one of the issues of uh, the fact that uh, we have for a long time depended on local connectivity. Suddenly, when things become global, uh, you're in a situation where regional governance doesn't work as well as it used to. And this creates quite a crisis because it means that if you want to have financial regulation that has to work or is going to work, it's got to become more and more international financial regulation. And I don't know anyone in the United States who wants to trust Europe to regulate our markets, and I'm sure the Europeans don't want to trust us to regulate theirs. So uh, anybody who's aggressive uh, is going to arbitrage the rules, right? And uh, what they're going to do is operate in the place with the best rules. And so the competitive environment works against doing a lot of these things that would be rational. Do you think there's a risk in the sense that we become so dependent on the Internet, your local Safeway store can't even get food delivered to it unless it's all dispatched by the Internet. Is there a possibility of a catastrophic system failure? Uh, it could be caused by war or sabotage or natural disasters or buggy code um, that just brings it to a halt. Well, you had the video of the Internet. And the Internet was designed by people who were thinking about a very benign environment. It was people in universities sharing data with other well-behaved people in universities. It was not designed to be uh, the backbone of the financial infrastructure of the world. And as a result, it is not as secure as it should be for that job. Cybersecurity is a, a, a real issue, and if you look at things uh, that can go wrong, uh, and there's reason to believe that somebody could take down the power grid in the United States right now. Or uh, it, it, it was in, uh, uh, I guess it was Latvia that is the most, uh, probably one of the most interconnected countries in the world, and the Russians designed uh, a, a, a cyber attack on them, or we think it was the Russians, that you know brought the Latvian financial system to a screeching halt. This is the most vulnerable country to, to, to cyber attack because we are so dependent upon all the internet uh, things to do. And in much the, the uh, same way with the internet, the best offense is a great defense. Too much of our energies uh, from a national point of view have gone into us worrying about how we can wage uh, cyber war but we have not worried enough about what we can do to prevent cyber war from coming to us. I'd, I'd love to ask you more questions, but I've got the signal we're just about out of time, so we are going to have to wrap. I'd like to thank my guest, Bill Davidow, author of the new book, Overconnected. Thank you for watching. I'm Marty Wasserman. Visit our website, www.futuretalk.net. For Future Talk, we'll see you next time.